voice. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's live stream presentation. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. It's great to be back on here with my good friend, Dr. Peter Carmichael of the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College. Evening, Pete. How are you doing there, John? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Awesome. Uh, last week, we have Angie Zombeck. I'm going to introduce her in just a moment. Uh, last week, Angie uh, showed everyone that I got this box <laughs> right from a friend I gave him a battlefield tour and last week completely full and we are now down to oh my gosh two measly boxes uh, <laughs> now of course I've been generous and I've shared it with my family but I can barely fit into my shirt I'm like a big marshmallow myself right now and my shirt if you'll see is Morgan Bryan Morgan Bryan is my cousin who has played on the last two women's World Cup teams. And she's also a graduate of the University of Virginia. And I know everyone who is listening is probably envious of Morgan, that she had an opportunity to take history classes at UVA, and of course, take Gary Gallagher's Civil War class. And you would think just out of a sense of loyalty and family that she would have done just that. But she has the distinction of not taking a single history course while studying at the University of Virginia. So let's not hold it against Morgan, right? She's a hell of a soccer player. And of course she gives me all the credit for her development as a professional. Do you believe that Angie? No, but it was a good story. It is a good story. <laughs> we did play soccer when she was little. She says she has no memory of it. And uh, our first competitive soccer match was video games. She was like six or seven. She didn't really know that Brazil was a powerhouse in soccer. I did. And I let her, uh, she was Trinidad. So, oh, yeah. She's well, <laughs> oh. geography, don't you think? Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, it's going to be a rough transition, but Angie Zombeck is, I would say, quite the athlete, right? Yeah. Did, you, did you fence in college? I can't remember. Weren't you a fencer? <laughs> I think that would be dangerous. <laughs> I stick in repetitive motion, running, cycling, those kind of things, basketball even. A a Angie is a uh, spin instructor and her advisor at the University of Florida, Bill Link, has told me about your classes. I've never endured them. I think he said you were a masochist. I think that's his word. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, I guess. I've heard that rumor. It is true. Masochists <laughs> smile when they, uh, when they hear that. Laugh. And yeah, laugh. they laugh. Yeah, they laugh. <laughs> So you lead uh, courses, classes at Wilmington, North Carolina, where Angie is currently the assistant professor of history at UNC Wilmington. Before coming to Wilmington, she did her undergraduate degree at Worcester College in Ohio. And then she did her master's at Akron under Leslie Gordon, who is now at the University of Alabama. And then from there, off to the University of Florida and with Bill Link. Her dissertation was published by Kent State. Here it is. I, I should know it. Penitentiaries, punishments, and military prisons. And that's only what, two years old? Yeah, just two coming up on it. Yeah, two years old. Do you make all of your uh, folks in your spin class, do they have to buy one? <laughs> No. Come to my spin class if you have <laughs> my books. But we do joke that they're taking a class from somebody who wrote a book on punishment. So it, I guess it makes spin class make more sense. <laughs> my mask is theory is not so far off. Yeah. <laughs> well, Angie, uh, John and I, we run a pretty loose ship here and so loose that right now I'm going to be interrupted with my daughter who can't seem to open the door to my office. <laughs> you can do it, sweetie. And she's bringing me some tea. I should not mock her. <laughs> That's okay. The Thank ship you. is getting looser by the minute here. Absolutely. Is. <laughs> hey, guess what happened? She just just won. Just won. All right. Now, <laughs> I, got I got peeps. As you can see, I indulge my children. Um, so we go, it's pretty loose here, Angie, but I'd like to just begin. What drew you to the topic of civil war prisons? And then and from there, we can talk about uh, these prison breaks or prison escapes. Uh, or uh, the rest of the time. Yeah, I've um, 
actually been interested in the Civil War since I was 13 years old. Um, part of that was due to my parents and part of that was due to hearing a talk in eighth grade by a descendant of President McKinley who didn't talk when he came to my grade school about President McKinley. He talked about McKinley's service in the Civil War. So I was really interested in it from a young age. And then when I was doing my master's at the University of Akron under Leslie Gordon, I was kind of stumbling around for a thesis topic. And my parents and I went to Camp Chase and we saw the Confederate cemetery there. And I thought, this is a really interesting site. And I was thinking about how the home front influenced prison operation and prisoners mindsets and vice versa. So I started specifically looking at Civil War prisons when I was doing my master's. And then from there, I just carried that along um, into the University of Florida into my dissertation, which became my first book. So John, seriously, have you ever heard of anyone whose portal into the Civil War is William McKinley's Civil War service? <laughs> I've never I don't I don't think I have. No. I think it's the first. <laughs> and then her parents take her to Camp Chase. Like, what right. Is, yeah. oh, God. Definitely Can a first for me. me. <laughs> We're not going to Gettysburg. We're going to Camp Chase. What is <laughs> Camp Chase today? It's probably just a marker, isn't it? No, it's they, they only have the cemetery. It's walled off and it's I mean that's all that's left of what was the prison is there's twenty two hundred and sixty graves there. And um, it's pretty well maintained. I actually gave a talk there last May, which was a pretty cool setting to, to, to do that in. So yeah, but there's, I mean, like a lot of other military prisons, there aren't that much left of a lot of them. Some of them there are, but places like Camp Chase or Johnson's Island, it's just the cemetery that's left. And did your parents after Camp Chase, they're like, okay, let's go visit Civil War hospital sites. Is that what I'm saying? They worked you up to about No, they skipped yeah. over that. <laughs> they stopped the prisons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Angie, I, I'm hoping that we can sort of weave in and out about your book as well. Yeah. Uh, talk about that. But I know we, I think people are really interested in uh, this idea of prison escapes, prison breaks. And mm -hmm. I know that you put something on the Gettysburg compiler, which is the Civil War Institute's uh, blog. I know that you posted a document relating to John Hatton Morgan's escape. So could you give us a little story, a quick narrative about that? And, and basically why should we, why, why does it matter? Why should we care? Yeah, absolutely. Um, John Hunt Morgan's incarceration in the Ohio Penitentiary is a good starting point to talk about a lot of different issues related to Civil War prisons and related to escapes because he specifically escaped from the Ohio Penitentiary. But in the moment in 1863, when he was actually at the Ohio Penitentiary, there were a lot of different things going on in the Northern home front, especially in Ohio. So there's a Peace Democrat movement. There's actually a conspiracy among some Ohio Ohioans um, led by the state school commissioner to actually try and release Morgan independent of Morgan's own scheme and then also concurrently release the prisoners at Camp Chase. So when Morgan gets to Ohio in July of 1863 and he's apprehended, what Union authorities decide to do with him and what ends up being about 70 of his men is instead of putting them in Camp Chase, they put them in the Ohio Penitentiary. Now they did put some of his other um, cavalrymen in Camp Chase. But there ended up being eventually about 70 of Morgan's raiders who were actually put in the Ohio Penitentiary. And the thing that was significant about Morgan being there is instead of classifying him as a prisoner of war, the Union officials decided that they would imprison him as a common horse thief. And so it, he gets criminal status right off the bat. And when he's taken into the Ohio Penitentiary, there's this whole outcry in the media and among some of their sympathizers, many of whom were actually in Columbus, mm -hmm. that when they apprehend John Hunt Morgan, they take him right into the Ohio Penitentiary, they shave his head. And that was kind of a common process mm -hmm. um, that penitentiary officials did when they brought convicts in. But since it was John Hunt Morgan because of his status, mm -hmm. yeah. people just really were up in arms about it. Yeah, the whole, it's humiliating, right? <laughs> yeah it is. It's, and that, I mean, that was that was entirely the point was to humiliate him in that way by treating him as a convict. So that said, when he's and his men are placed in the Ohio penitentiary, the warden Nathaniel Marion wanted to keep Morgan and his men under civilian guard because those penitentiary guards, they probably didn't love their job. 
but they at least knew the routine of the prison. But instead, what Marion was subject to, coming from the directions that he got from federal officials, was to take Morgan and his men, separate them, and bring in an independent federal military guard to guard them. And those guys, of course, don't want to be there. I mean, guarding a prison, whether it's the Ohio Penitentiary or whether it's Camp Chase or Andersonville or wherever it is, is not a task that anybody wanted to undertake during the Civil War. And so the military guard that was, was appointed specifically to keep watch over John Hunt Morgan didn't do their jobs. What was supposed to happen was the men, the prisoners, all prisoners are supposed to police their quarters every day, meaning clean them, and the guards are supposed to check up on that. Well, Morgan and his guys had a whole bunch of idle time on their hands because instead of making them work in the congregate shops like the other convicts were doing, they just kept Morgan and his guys idle in their cells. So the combination of that idleness and the fact that the military detachment that was sent to guard Morgan wasn't checking up on what the guys were actually doing in their cells, that opened up the possibility that essentially every time that Morgan and his men went to the dining hall for dinner, they started smuggling forks, knives, spoons, plates. And they figured out that the range of cells that they inhabited was right above an air shaft at the bottom of the penitentiary. So all they needed to do to escape was to be able to start digging into that air shaft and then eventually that would be their ticket to freedom. And so they start digging in early November, 1863. And then Morgan and six of his guys escape on the 20th of November. So while all- Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm good. So it's kind of like Shawshank Redemption. Did they have like a, a big yeah, poster yeah. of Bell Boyd on the wall? Yeah. And then behind me, Bell Boyd. Yeah. <laughs> so this, I mean, just the fact that Morgan and his guys are at the Ohio Penitentiary. The rest of his band is at Camp Chase. And in the meantime, there's a whole bunch of dissent from the Peace Democrat movement on the Ohio home front. And so the guards, not just at the Ohio Penitentiary, but more so even at Camp Chase, kind of ironically, are really on high alert and afraid because of the rumored conspiracy that prisoners are going to break out. Now, the irony is that attention is most drawn to Camp Chase, where Morgan and his guys are kind of under the radar. Yeah. But from September to December 1863, there's an actual escape of 12 soldiers from Camp Chase. By tunneling out, they do reach the south. And guards then at Camp Chase get put on high alert, and they end up shooting five prisoners for basically minor offenses. And the minor offenses include things like, you know, having a light on after tattoo had sounded. <laughs> so there's there's a there's a lot going on there. <laughs> right. wow. Wow. So um, I just I, I would like for you to help us understand that the use of a penitentiary for prisoners of war mm -hmm. that was somewhat shocking, uh, controversial, and if so, so can you kind of help us understand why that's such a big deal? Sure, yeah, I mean, most of it has to do with the stigma. I mean, honestly, it wasn't an uncommon practice because when the Civil War broke out, I mean, really, the federal government and the Confederate government newly formed had absolutely no experience with imprisonment. And so they end up, you know, commandeering existing factories, they end up hastily building stockades, and they turn to penitentiaries like they had in previous wars, like the War of 1812. So the whole problem with this really, and especially for a guy like Morgan, is it's the stigma. Because you know by the time the Civil War breaks out that if you're in a penitentiary, you're a criminal. And that's something that's totally opposite to the reputation that you'd have as a soldier. When, when Morgan breaks, right? Could you get us, how, is, how, does, how does it end, his escape? How does it end? Where does it go? He ends up actually going into Richmond, Virginia, and he's um, escorted by the city battalion to City Hall. And he eventually, on January 9th, 1864, visits Libby Prison because he knows some of the people who are held there since they, they're all from Kentucky. And Morgan has essentially an audience with those prisoners who happen to have been working on their own tunnel 
since about the same time John Hunt Morgan and his guys were working on theirs in the Ohio Penitentiary. <laughs> so that tunnel in Libby Prison um, was headed by Colonel Rose and Lieutenant Hamilton. And they, I mean, what, what happens after Morgan gets there is that there's a lot of Confederate officials, the Confederate press that basically say that Morgan's presence and his talking with the prisoners at Libby Prison was basically responsible for giving the Libby prisoners the idea to, to tunnel themselves, right. which in reality, I mean, that effort had been going on for, for months. And what motivated those guys was, well, number one, they don't like being in prison, of course, right? But the other thing that's happening is behind Libby prison, about 40 feet away from the prison itself, there was an area where Confederate officials were storing boxes that were sent to the Union POWs. And the Union POWs knew that Confederate guards were pillaging them. Mm -hmm. So what they wanted to do is essentially tunnel and access that space. So because it was guarded by a wall. So they knew if they could get underground and beyond into that area with their, where they were holding boxes, they could number one, kind of get back at the Confederate guards for pillaging mm -hmm. their stuff. And number two, get out. Mm -hmm. But this is kind of a, it's a, it's a heck of a feat really at Libby because they need access to the basement. And a lot of the guys, Libby's an old commandeered factory and a lot of the guys are on the higher floors, but they know that in the cook room, which is on the ground floor, which gives access to the basement, that there's not a guard station. So they figure out how to, by tying together clothes, actually get down into that cook room, tunnel into the basement. And they work on this tunnel for weeks, it's really organized. Like Colonel Rose has about 14 guys working at a time. There's a few union prisoners that actually feign escape to live in the tunnel so they can work on it continuously. But most of the digging is done at night and the POWs after the fact are kind of writing in their memoirs or in their diaries saying that it's so ironic that at night when the guards are calling out all is well that all of this digging is going on. Mm -hmm. So come February 1864, they are eventually able to break loose. So this is after they had one foiled attempt, like the one, the initial tunnel that they dig, dug was too short. So it had to be at least 50 or 60 feet and they ended up going short. So the opening of it came out right at the Confederate guards beat. So that didn't work, but still it didn't tip anybody off really. So on February 9th, 1864, that they successfully tunnel into that area that I mentioned before. And the original plan was to just kind of slowly funnel people out just a few at a time from seven o'clock at night to five o'clock in the morning. But people get so excited about it that originally 109 people flee, not all of them make it out, but some of them do about 59 of them actually did make it out with the help of um, slaves, freed blacks, even some unionists like Elizabeth Van Loo. Well. Yes, and, and in the end of it, a lot of the prisoners are saying, you know, Morgan didn't inspire this. Like the, the Confederate press, Confederate authorities are giving credit to him as if tunneling was a new thing and it's not. It's the most obvious way to get out of prison, they say, since prisoners were invented. <laughs> you know, uh, oh, I'm sorry, John, go right ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask why the why the complacency with the Confederate guards? Did they think it was I, you couldn't escape Libby? Did they just think it was impenetrable? Is that is that why there was because there's it seems like there's on both sides at, at Camp Chase and at uh, or I, I'm sorry Ohio Penn and Libby there's complacency all of a sudden. Why? There definitely, I think was complacency with the Ohio guards because they're not used to penitentiary discipline at all, and they just kind of drop the ball. At Libby, I think it's a little bit more of a complicated story and there really isn't that much commentary on it until the aftermath, where General Winder, who's in charge of Richmond, Richmond's prisons, thinks that there's collusion between the guards and the inmates, like the inmates are paying them off somehow or bribing them in some way, which did happen. But eventually one of the guards found the tunnel and they just, they, it, they totally flew under the radar. Wow. It's like uh, they, all these guards sort of foreshadow uh, Schultz and Hogan's Heroes. You're too young <laughs> for Hogan's Heroes, aren't you, Angie? Have you ever seen Hogan's Heroes? Depends, <laughs> not in full. You've seen it, John, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, so, yeah. I, mean, I like John, though. I mean, the, the level of incompetency, it's not even incompetency. I think that they were utterly disinterested in doing their job. And it, 
And again, usually those, I know in Richmond at least, a lot of those Richmond companies, they were filled of, of either really old men or really young men. And, uh, and often, of course, you know, from impoverished areas. Uh, so their disinterestedness uh, uh, speaks to uh, sort of a, just a general sort of not caring about Confederate cause and the outcome of the war at all. You can't, you can't blame Winder for believing that there had to be some degree of collusion because that degree of incompetency is pretty hard to, hard to imagine. Yeah, and this is a point in the war too where the Richmond prisons are really significantly crowded. I mean, this is just before they start funneling the prisoners into Georgia to get them out of the capital because they're afraid of the Union campaigns that are coming. And anytime there's a fear of a campaign, like this is the case with Sherman when he gets into Georgia, there's actually the Kilpatrick Dahlgren raid, which is also 1864, that raises a whole bunch of kind of paranoia that they're going to get to Libby prison and free the prisoners. So, I mean, there's, there's a level of apathy, I think, from the guards, and there's there's a lot of bodies to watch and guarding prisons. I mean, there was, re there was really never, I mean, every prison is different, but there's really never any hard, fast, set in stone number of guards that were needed. It was basically what was there. And at the end of the war, towards the end of the war, right. that becomes more difficult. Right. So, so Angie, again, to ask you a question that is uh, an unfair one, because it's, it's going to require you to make some sweeping generalizations, but let's just go to it anyways. Now, I want to try to understand those who are incarcerated, those in captive. And, and I, I'm curious again about, was there a sense of feeling like emasculated, that they had been dishonored, that, uh, that somehow, some way that it was their fault to end up where they were? Right? I mean, I'm trying to get a feel again for how, because you talk a lot in your book about their identity, and I, I'm trying to get a sense of what that really means. The strongest sense of identity that I got from the POWs was that when they were in prison, even though it's a military prison, and even though the laws of war draw a clear distinction between prisoners of war and criminals, living at the moment they did during the Civil War in the 19th century, Americans were just getting used to long-term incarceration as punishment. Mm. So these guys really internalize, whether they're at a military prison or not, if they're you know, at a stockade, if they're actually at a penitentiary, they cannot help but feeling like they are felons. There are so many references in diaries that men write saying, I feel like a murderer, I'm treated worse than a murderer, I feel like a felon, I've been doomed to the felon's place. Right. And there were also a lot of um, diaries that I found where men are writing them as if they're writing to their wife and then they never send them anything. And one man specifically who was incarcerated at Andersonville just full out admits that the reason he's not contacting his wife is because he can't bear to let her know that he's actually in prison. So I think that does, like you say, get to that idea of, I mean, you're, you're stripped of your honor, you're stripped of your manhood, you're, at, you're really at the whim of guards. John, if you're, go, go ahead, John. Yeah, I was wondering what other um, influences did antebellum penitentiary systems have upon even just the guard system? Because I'm sure guarding prisoners wasn't, a, you know, a, like an exclusive club where you wanted to be doing it all the time. And maybe that led to some of the breakdown. I don't, I'm not sure. But how did antebellum systems kind of play into the penitentiary system during the war? There's a lot of inexperience. There's a lot of turnover. And from an administrative standpoint, the punishments are shared. So, I mean, particularly if we talk about references to escapes, I mean, if, you, if you're going to attempt to escape or you do attempt to escape, then you risk being strung up by your thumbs, put in solitary confinement, um, put in solitary confinement on a bread and water diet with or without a ball and chain. You're subject to bucking and gagging. So there's one way that the kind of penitentiary system, so to speak, influences the administrative side. But let's not forget it, at Camp Chase, if you leave your nightlight on, you get yeah. shot by the guard. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. And that too is, like I said, it, it's at this period of time where it's, you know, it's high tension. And Commissary General Hoffman at that point, when some of these guys are getting shot, basically says, you know, Maybe that was overreaction by the guards, but at this point in time, they're following their orders and it's worth the lesson. 
mm. you know, for reaction. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, yep. oh, so, so Angie, again, to sort of build upon what John's saying, can you sort of give us a feel for, for the conditions um, within inside these camps? And I know they vary greatly. Mm -hmm. And how I'd like for you to maybe help us understand how this fits within historiography. And what I mean by that is, you know, what were historians interested in? Like William Heseltine, I've yeah. not mentioned. Heseltine and his, um, his book is still available, no? Yes. Uh, Heseltine's work is still available. And there was, I think, again, what historians were sort of asking about. And because the questions you're asking seem to be very, very different. And, and again, I don't want us to get on a long uh, discussion of historiography. But I think it would be useful to know, again, these changes and how that has helped you and others. And I'm going to talk maybe a little bit about Evan Kutzler's recent book as well, uh, about how we talk about the conditions within in these in these prisons. Well, I think early on when Heseltine wrote and others writing after him are really interested in questions of policy and how policy implement, in, impacted the treatment of POWs. The other driving question is really, is there intentional maltreatment? Yeah. And I think in the, in the last 20, certainly 10 years or so, there's been a shift away from policy questions to looking at more aspects of social history. In my case, I'm looking at really the history of institutions and the operation of institutions, but I'm also looking at how people inside of those institutions are reacting to their situation. Yeah. Because I mean, it's easy to assume in a setting like a prison that the power dynamics are unidirectional from the guards to the prisoners. And that's not the case at all. I mean, looking at escapes really is a good way to kind of stand that assumption about power dynamics on their head. Because there were some instances where prisoners did successfully, like for example, at Salisbury prison, um, there were two really pretty prominent journalists incarcerated. One of them was Junius Henry Brown. And he and one of his compatriots that was incarcerated there knew that one of the guards, Lieutenant Wellborn, was a unionist, defected from the Confederate Army, got put in a station where he's guarding at Salisbury. And Wellborn essentially helps Brown and his compatriot escape to freedom, gives them directions on how to get north. So there, there's that going on. But also too, I mean, you can't assume that the prisoners are all like-minded. So in another instance at Salisbury in 1864, there was a plot where about nine of the prisoners seized weapons. And when the guards changed, they did, a, did that about every two hours. That was pretty standard. And prisoners knew that that was a, a moment that they could take advantage of the uncertainty as the guard was changing. And so there ended up being about a thousand prisoners at Salisbury that tried to rush the guard and break out. And that melee was essentially put down, not just with the guards, but with the help of some incarcerated convicts and also federal deserters. So the prisoners always kind of had to be on the lookout for people who, of their own ranks, right? Their own comrades who might turn against them. I mean, that's a common story too at Andersonville. Like one of the common occupations there was tunneling. I mean, very few people actually got out of Andersonville by tunneling. But guys who are working on tunnels, I mean, why are they doing it? I mean, they're passing the time, they're giving themselves hope, but they're, they're always running the risk of who's going to be the whistleblower. Yeah. And whistleblowers have a certain set of motivations. They might get extra rations, they might get a plug of tobacco. So there's a whole array of ways that we can talk about yeah. power dynamics being completely fluid. Yes, and that, and that internal dynamic, well, I think that's really well said. So I, the first time point that you made, I want to throw it over to John and see what his reaction is to this. And you said that the early scholarship, you said seemed to be focused on trying to make a determination as to whether policy toward prisoners, whether it be Northern or Southern prisoners, whether that policy was intentional to do harm, right? To hurt. Um, uh, so when, when, you, when you raise that question, Angie, I guess what I'm, I'm sort of assuming that it's about what prison was worse. Was Andersonville worse than Elmira? Was Johnson Island, was it, you know, 
worse than uh, you know, another, uh, we can say living, right? right. So, I, so I'll go to John here and I'll say, John, when you think about your knowledge and your study of Civil War prisons, don't you, how do you think about Andersonville and don't you sort of sometimes like rank them like oh this was the worst or this was the worst I'm just curious your own thoughts about how you have thought about our understanding of civil war prisons. Uh, I can honestly say that my understanding of civil war prisons was heavily influenced by popular history. Uh, I'll, I'll admit it. Uh, because most of the books were like Andersonville or Once Upon Elmira would come out or something like that. But uh, having an ancestor who died at Andersonville made it more personal. I wanted to read a little bit more about it. And I started to realize that, uh, as Angie said earlier, the surrounding environment for me really came into focus. And how did this the area of operations, let's say, of a prison impact what the prison was actually like? Right. And uh, I... I, I I'm used to ranking, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm good at ranking. I'm like, tell me your top three rock bands. And I'm like, okay. So it's like, tell me your top three civil war prisons. Uh, but I've tried to not do that as much as I've gotten, you know, I guess further along in my studies. Uh, but I, I will say that instead of me being, um, you know, like really personal about, Andersonville and saying it was the worst because I had an ancestor who perished there. I've kind of started to look at the surroundings of what's going on in the environment around the prison as well, whether it be Elmira or Andersonville. And I'm not sure if that's the proper thing to do. I, I'd have to ask Angie that. Uh, but I started to try to take a more umbrella approach to it to see the whole picture of what's going on in the, in the area. But for me personally, Andersonville is one of the worst just because I did have a personal connection there, but that's just my thought. On so, so have you, John, have you been down there to visit Andersonville and to see his grave? I was going to go this year, but then this kicked up. Yeah. Uh, I was going to be the first person in my family to visit his grave. No yeah. one's ever gone. And we have his numbered grave number and all that, but I haven't had a chance, but that's, that's going to be something I want to do in the future. I, I assume died, died of dysentery? Uh, scurvy. Yeah. Died of scurvy in August of 64. He was captured by Mosby's Rangers and West Virginia hmm. and it just recently became West Virginia hmm. and he was sent south he was 52 years old and died in Andersonville right. so he's an old man for <laughs> a soldier. John have you ever read McKinley Cantor's novel of Andersonville? Yes a while back I did. I, I've, ne I've never read it. Angie have you read it? I haven't read it I've read the reaction to it right. among the scholars which came pretty early right. mm -hmm. and it, it's it's not very well received by them to say the least yeah it's been a while since i read it. it's been a long time since i read it so i can't you know without going back and looking at it i can't really comment on it but i have read it right but there's uh futch's f-u-t-c-h and i can't remember his first name ovid ovid that's right ovid futch's book that's held up pretty well and then william marvel's book on andersonville um of the Andersonville, are you very familiar with those books at all, Angie? Yeah, those I am, and I think Futch is still the pretty pretty much the standard in the yeah. field. I mean, they have it; they have a different kind of interpretation. Um, Marvel, the chief, I guess, criticism that he gets is he kind of essentially exonerates Henry Wurz. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think he sees Wurz as uh, just a product of what would become the black yeah. shirt right yeah. campaign, and I think they're also. I think that Marvel believes that a lot of the bloody shirt is that is the that's the filter through which we now judge Andersonville. But and I don't want to misstate his argument, but I've been somewhat puzzled by it because all you have to do is look at the photograph of that prisoner who survived and put quotes around that Andersonville, and I think that that uh, says it says it all. Um, and I think I'm, from that standpoint, what John was saying before is the surroundings matter. I mean, being at Andersonville, I mean, if you go there now, still, it's, I mean, it's, there's not a lot surrounding that area. And that was even more so the case during the Civil War. So if we take that and we compare it to a place like Richmond, where if you're incarcerated, I mean, you can look out the window at Libby Prison or Castle Thunder and you can see what's going on in, in the town. Yeah. In an point, Andersonville, you can't. Yeah. Point Lookout, uh, those Southerners could 
look across the Chesapeake Bay, if they looked hard enough, squinted hard enough, they could see uh, Virginia on the other side. I think some of the most powerful primary sources that I've ever encountered relating to prisons are the, I assume they're not watercolors, but they're sketches of the USCT or black guards uh, and their interactions with the Confederate prisoners at Point Lookout. <laughs> and I mean, they just, the black soldiers, and understandably so, tormented uh, yeah. those white POWs. Are, there's one caption in which a black soldier <laughs> yells to a, a Confederate, says, uh, my comrade is dating your sister right now. I mean, you can just imagine. And I, I'm sure that that was the PG version, right? Yeah. <laughs> I bet that was the PG version. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Th this point about the outside environment, Angie, uh, one of the things that's always struck me is incredibly odd are the number of women in the North mm -hmm. who are like pen pals with Confederate POWs. And there seemed to be a, a fair amount of interaction. And could you sort of just describe that for us? And what, to, what should we make of all that? I think there's a general sense that some people, and it's not really just limited to women, and I can give some other examples, want to help. They want to help people get by. So there were instances where, I mean, women would write to soldiers who are incarcerated on the opposing side and offer psychological support. They could offer actual, actual physical support by mailing things into the prison, which they were allowed to do. Now, when both of those things happened, the letters and the boxes and whatever was actually sent to the prison and whatever was going out was inspected. So I think there is kind of a general sense that people need to, to help those who are in dire straits. And the other place where I found that that comes through in a pretty significant way is from the clergy, particularly the Catholic clergy. And a, a primary example, um, I, and actually there's two, there's one Northern, one Southern, um, one is in Sandusky. Um, there's a priest by the name of Father Mullen who was actually attached to um, one of the U.S. units up in Ohio. And he witnessed the suffering in the prison at Johnson's Island and essentially wrote to Commissary General Hoffman and said, hey, these guys are suffering. You, you're doing what you can to alleviate their and help with their physical needs, but there should also be something done to help them spiritually. And that became kind of a way that guys could get by. The other instance of that, of clergymen, in particular Catholic clergy, trying to get into the prisons took place at Andersonville, where, I mean, most famously, Father Peter Whelan lived at the prison for a series of weeks, a couple of months, actually, oh, to help the guys out to, to, I mean, he served not just the, the Catholic prisoners, but he also ministered to Protestants, too. He, he served as a spiritual guide. He brought them what? aid that he could. And that was something that did help them get by. So I think there's kind of a general sense among women and also among clergymen that this is a crisis and we need to do something about it. So Angie and I didn't uh, set this up before, but this uh, point that she's making about a Catholic priest uh, visiting prisoners, she has an entire article about that in this book, Crossing the Deadlines, the Civil War Prisons Reconsidered. Oh, there it is. Edited by Michael Gray. You have a piece in there. Um, I, I think Evan, uh, yeah. Evan does as well. Uh, and it's again, a book that also will provide a really good overview by Michael of the yeah. nature uh, scholarship on, on Civil War prison. Hmm. So I have another question for John. It's going to be a tough one. Ready? John? <laughs> I feel like one of your students. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> we don't want that. Um, and then I, I'm, easy, I'm interested in Angie jumping in here as well. You know, Angie, what you've just described to me, especially what was occurring in the North and how civilians, uh, seeing that these men were suffering, wanting to try to alleviate their suffering, and some examples of that even in the South. You know, when people say to me that our civil war was different. There are civil war uh, that in places uh, it doesn't have uh, that vindictiveness, uh, that bitterness that animated so many other civil wars or just other wars in general. I mean, hell, all we got to do is think about what the Germans did to the first batch of Soviet prisoners that they captured. 
let them die, right? Starved them or shot them in the head, right? And, and we can think of other civil wars, it's obviously not a civil war, in which we see brutality that is in no way uh, mitigated by officers uh, or by civilians. And so John, here is the big question. And the big question is, do we look at civil war prisons and maybe it is a reminder that our civil war, while I'm not suggesting that it was humane, I'm not suggesting that it was a war between men who simply respected each other as Americans. I'm not saying that, but I am having us come to terms with the fact that what Angie describes to me is, it doesn't seem like a civil war to me. Hmm. I'm not suggesting it's a great camp out and that Northern and Southern men just got together and had a good time for four years, right. but this does make it hard for me as a teacher, right? How do, how do I introduce this and, and make it make sense? Mm. When we're trying again to get a handle on the nature of the war itself. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what's so unique about civil wars in general is that uh, you don't have two different outlooks on, in this case, penitentiary systems. It's one outlook on a penitentiary system antebellum wise that comes smashing together and it just happens to be one side believes that they're their own independent country and one side believes that they're illegitimate. It's it's kind of like, it's one, to me, it's one of the unique qualities of a civil war is that you're taking all these ideals that happened before the war that were brought up before the war and you're only separating them by what flag they're fighting under or what they believe in. Uh, it's different when you say like with, like you've said, it's different with the Germans and the Russians and, and you see this brutality and such. It's not to say that civil war wasn't brutal at all. The numbers suggest that it is. Uh, but I think that's what's uniquely different about any civil war is that we're, we're, we're taking two sides, putting them together and they actually have the old antebellum ways of doing certain things, uh, whether it be religious things or whether it be penitentiary or anything else and it makes it unique because it showcases how close they actually were together it was just a number of ideals or one major ideal in the case of, of chattel slavery causing this rupture be between the two or the rapture between the two and i i don't it's it's a huge question where it's kind of like you know do we sugarcoat it sometimes because it is sometimes, you know, not as brutal as what we saw on the Eastern Front and the Second World War and Belgium in the First World War. Uh, it's an interesting question and a dynamic that I think uh, everyone has an opinion on, but I think it goes back to the uniqueness of what a civil war actually is. So, so Angie, then how do you do that with your students? When you talk to your students about Andersonville, they know that, right? So how do you handle this with your, with your students? What do you stress? I think one of the things that I really stress is we are living in different times. So there's, there's at least two sides to every story is something that I'm famous for saying. And in the case of the Civil War and specifically in the case of Civil War prisons, there are the gestures of humanity that we talked about before with the Catholic priests and the women and people from the home front that you know, wanna get supplies to these prisoners. But on the other side, we're living in a, in, a, in a moment during the Civil War where we're dealing with 19th century military discipline. And that is a different yeah. world than we're living in now. And it's very, very shocking to the civilians who then become volunteers. So what I mean by that is military discipline could entail things like whipping to a certain extent that was a it was abolished in the regular army in the 1830s but the confederacy for example at castle thunder um, when george alexander was commandant that was a common punishment and it was sanctioned through just about the middle of the civil war and, the, and confederate regiments i mean yep. the confederate armies they used it on each other right? yeah and there's there's kind of some i really kind of i use the laws of war the Libra code to address this issue because like I said before, and, and specifically in relationship to Civil War prisons, there's been a lot of question about policy throughout time as, as scholars have been writing. And according to the Lieber Code, there's, there's some wiggle room for people to take some measures and implement some punishments, some of which I mentioned before, that you wouldn't assume would be there. 
So for example, like we're talking about escapes today, the Libra code doesn't consider escape to be a crime. And it says in the Libra code that there should be no punishment meted out to anybody who attempts escape. However, mm -hmm. if the guards catch you in flight, they can shoot you. shoot you. And the other part of that provision is when that person who has attempted escape and failed is brought back, stricter measures may be necessary. So what does that mean? I mean, there's no, there's no guideline there. And so some of the brutality that we talk about in terms of commandants punishing men physically, which again, during the 19th century was normal, kind of comes out of that notion. How did, how did uh, the, the stoppage of prisoner exchanges, how did that really influence the environment in these areas? Yeah, it certainly, um, it certainly creates obviously more overcrowding and I think a lot more desperation because I mean, one of the things that prisoners tried to keep alive was a sense of hope. And while the exchange cartel was in existence from the summer of 62 to the summer of 63, mm -hmm. I mean, pe people didn't know when they went into a military prison just how long that they were, they were gonna be there, but at least they could somewhat envision an endpoint. When that's gone, there's that kills hope in the POWs then have to turn to other means, whether it's God, whether it's writing letters, which of course they're dealing with the irregular, the irregularities of the mail and the fact that prison guards are reading what's going in and out. And that makes it uncertain that their letter is actually going to get home and the letter from home is going to get to them. Or they try to deal with that through attempting escapes. So, I mean, I think really that's the biggest psychological impact on the prisoners is once the exchange cartel is off i mean you're you could sit there who knows how long we see a rise in those escape uh attempts because of or after that maybe because of that or is it kind of like a you know it goes plateaus and it goes down and back up or in the prisons that i've studied i've found that escape attempts did increase come 1864 okay. but it's not I mean, tunneling, like we've talked about before, and one of the POWs that Louis said is kind of the, the oldest way imaginable that prisoners have, have thought about getting out. It's not through that. I mean, there's some instances, like I mentioned with Salisbury, where the guys try to overpower the guard. There's actually um, a similar instance in um, at Camp Chase in July of 1864. And this is around the same time that the Chicago conspiracy is being plotted the first wave of that among Peace Democrats, plotters from Canada, and actually um, one of Colonel John Hunt Morgan's men, Thomas Hines, was kind of the mastermind beyond that. And they wanted to liberate the prisoners in Chicago. They wanted to liberate the prisoners at Alton and Springfield and essentially take over the Northwest and make a Northwest conspiracy. So there's unrest at Camp Chase too in the, in the summer of 1864. And in July, 1864 on Independence Day, the POWs plot a mass stampede. <laughs> it, they don't, it doesn't work, but the plot is there. Mm -hmm. But that, I'm, I raised that point to say that that's really the exception rather than the rule. So what prisoners are doing to kind of try and get out is not necessarily tunnel. It's not necessarily try to orchestrate these mass escape attempts. They're trying to take advantage of their surroundings. So at Camp Chase, for example, the prisoners were supposed to, as far as practicable, according to the Union authorities, complete any improvements that they could at the camp to save money, essentially. But the federal government did still have to hire people to come in. And there were some workers who were there to kind of help whitewash and dig trenches and whatever the prison authorities happened to need at Camp Chase. And prisoners found out that those guys were Southern sympathizers. And so the day laborers that were coming to the camp day kind of got in cahoots with some of the POWs. The POW said, hey, you want to loan us some clothes, civilian clothes, so that we can leave with you at the end of the day? And that's exactly what they did. Wow. And it's kind of a similar situation at Andersonville. Of course, there's no hope for exchange once you get to Andersonville. And a lot of the details, like wood detail, which is a necessity for the guys inside the stockade, were done by the prisoners. They're supervised. And the best hope that those guys really had to get out of Andersonville was to break on those wood details. But the other side of the story is they have to remain conscious that if they do that, 
it wasn't beyond Henry Wurz to punish either the entire squad for ration distributions. They organized the guys in what were called 90s for ration distributions. And if one guy from your 90 got out, then until that person was returned, they could withhold rations from you. Or the other side of that was, okay, you broke out on a wood detail. Well, now you're not gonna have any more wood detail. Mm -hmm. So how do you survive that? So there's always kind of a, a risk in addition to whatever your hope is to actually get out. So uh, I'm going to go back uh, to, to Camp Chase, and I'm thinking about your your first visit there, and the fact <laughs> that there was just a cemetery there. I still <laughs> find that to be a curiosity. Um, and we know of Andersonville uh, Libby Prison. I suspect most of our viewers uh, know that it no longer stands. The, the bricks of Libby, I believe, are part of a barn in northern Indiana. They were going to rebuild Libby. I believe at the World's Fair in Chicago. I might have my facts off a little bit there. So there is no Libby to visit. Uh, am I overlooking something pretty obvious? I've been to Point Lookout. There's really not much there left because of erosion, I think, largely. Um, how about Camp Douglas, uh, which is also uh, Ohio site? Have you been to, to Camp Douglas at all to see what's there? I know there's an association dedicated to its interpretation. No, it's Chicago, but I haven't been there. To oh, I'm sorry, I meant to say Johnson Island. Excuse oh, me. yeah, yeah. Um, Johnson's Island is the same story. Um, at the end of the war, the federal government basically dismantled the prison and they gave the island back to its original owner, but he agreed to keep the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And for a while, I believe it was until 1931, if I have that correct, he maintained possession of that property. Or no, it was, early, maybe it was earlier 20th century. The UDC bought it. And then eventually they donated the cemetery to the, to the federal government. So there are 200 markers there, yeah. but there are actually more internment sites identified through radar. Yeah. But it's the same thing. I mean, it's, it's actually smaller than the cemetery at Camp Chase. Yeah. It's fenced off and there's one, there's one large monument yeah. at the opening of that cemetery at Johnson's Island. Yeah, and there is a group that's devoted to its interpretation now. I, I don't, I don't remember what their long-term plans are, but it's good to know um, that the people might have access to that site down down the road. Yeah, absolutely. It's difficult to find if you go to look for it, but it's worth it. I mean, they do have the interpretive markers there too, along with the cemetery. Cemetery as well. I, I have some other questions here, John. Did we have any questions that are rolled in, or can I go with my next question? You can go with yours. I can look while you're doing that. So, um, AJ, I'm, I'm curious about, you've been to Andersonville, um, how are public historians, can you kind of give us some insights into the challenges of interpreting these historic sites? Uh, I mean, there's a, the first challenge is the physical remains are just simply not there. I think Andersonville, they rebuilt part of the stockade. So yeah. tell us what these challenges are from the the, the cultural or historical landscape to what are the um, expectations, assumptions that visitors are making. And I, and I should quickly note, Angie also is a veteran of the Park Service. You spent at least two summers. You did one summer at Fredericksburg mm -hmm. and then you worked like at a canal site in Ohio. Yeah, Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Yeah. That's right. I just again, why I'm making that point is that John and I did an earlier show in which I pointed out that people point to the CWI conference and they say, oh, it's just a bunch of academics, when in fact, the, the vast majority of us are public historians and have had experience doing it, and you're one of them. So you can speak to this issue about public history and the Civil War prison experience. Yeah, and I actually have my NPS cap behind me, so I can put I it I did see that. That's very <laughs> If you need me to. <laughs> it's in absolutely perfect condition. <laughs> my, wife. Yeah, my wife has hers as well. Uh, Ashley, <laughs> Ashley Lusky, who works at CWI, she has hers. I don't know. Mine was taken away from me. I was stripped <laughs> of that for unprofessionalism. That's hard to imagine, I know. Uh, I actually donated the uniforms to the Andersonville closet when I went there for research for my book. <laughs> you did? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I kept the hat. I had to keep the hat. So <laughs> anyway, full confession. Um, but POWs, I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges is when we think about warfare, they're on the sidelines, and that's especially been the case with Civil War history. 
So it's, it's bringing that narrative into the forefront that I really think is the first challenge. And I can say that I think Andersonville does an absolutely superb job on the ground and really through the resources that they, that they offer on their website. So on the ground, um, their interpretive programs, interpretive markers want to give visitors a sense of what it was like to be in prison there. They want to give prisoners a sense of what the commemoration was like. And last year, I had the privilege of being invited to their Living History Days, where I spoke um, actually about the Catholic priests that I mentioned before. Cool. And I was really impressed at how much they connected with the public by first person interpretation through people like Father Whelan, by doing a reenactment of prisoners actually being brought to the stockade. So I think those programs are really valuable at raising questions and, and getting people's interest peak in the topic of POWs. That is in conjunction, of course, with the POW Museum, which is just an absolutely moving experience. It's not just limited to Civil War POWs, it's POWs across the scope of American history. And it, it gives you direct voices from captivity. It again, tries to give you a sense of what it would, what it would have been like mm -hmm. mentally, physically to be incarcerated. I mean, you come out of that just kind of needing a moment of silence, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. And then there's, of course, there's, in recent years, Andersonville has really been focused on kind of dispelling myths that right. surround Civil War prisons. Myths about wars being the only person tried and convicted by a military tribunal, myths about you know, even the topic that we're talking about now, about you know my ancestor escaped from Andersonville is one of the myths that they want to dispel. Right. So I think those efforts are really important in reaching the public. And then of course, one issue that you've talked about before is introducing the issue of black POWs and black prison guards. I think that's been kind of a general movement across the National Park Service at Civil War sites in recent years. John, did you have any questions here before? I did get a I did get a question about Andersonville, which was kind of interesting. Was when were there any escape attempts out of there when they heard that Sherman's army was nearby? Would that make them want to go? Because I think they actually brought that up in the in the film that TNT did. But I'm wondering if one of our watchers is wondering if that's a, a thing that actually occurred. They were afraid of that threat. And at that moment in 1864, Confederate authorities started kind of shifting the prisoners around to different sites in really the Carolinas. Actually, Lorian Foote has a good um, book of, about that, The Yankee Plague. Um, and it deals with actually prisoners escaping when they're being moved. But there weren't really, I mean, in the, at the moment of, of Sherman's campaign, I mean, of course the prisoners hope that he's going to come and liberate them. But at that moment, there isn't a significant uptick in escape attempts, nor was there a significant uptick in escape attempts as the population grew throughout 1864. Hmm. Angie, I'm glad you mentioned Lorian Foot, F-O-O-T-E, Lorian Foot. Yankee Plague is an excellent book. Mm -hmm. She's a hell of a historian. She's a Texas a and she's, she's quite good. There's, is it, tell me if this is a myth. I read or heard somewhere that, I don't know if it's true, that Sherman's men on their march to Georgia, that if they ever encountered a dog, they always killed dogs because they said the dogs, if they didn't kill it, that that dog could be used to track down either a slave or a prisoner. Have you ever encountered that? Is that really the case? They did use dogs to check for escaped prisoners at Anderson, yeah. for sure. Maybe that is true, that Sherman's men did kill any hound they came across. Oh, that's possible. Well, Angie, one more time, I want to, again, note your very fine book uh, that you have. And again, what Angie does, that reveals how rich Civil War scholarship is, how one can take uh, the story of a prison and, in fact, situate that within the long 19th century so that we, as readers, uh, can tease out its greater significance it's an impressive book. Angie now has moved on to something that is as different as, as you could possibly imagine, a community study of, he go ahead and tell the audience. <laughs> it's, um, I'm working on a, a book called Stronghold of the Union, Key West Under Martial Law. Key West. Now, Angie, wait, did your parents take you to Key West as well? <laughs> <laughs> that was my responsibility. I can't put that on. 
around them. <laughs> I'm just wondering how many graduate students are saying, we would love to be your research assistant and we'll do it for free. Yes. Send us to Key West. Be a yeah. long lineup. <laughs> I can tell you a couple, uh, just a brief anecdote since I've yes. talked about it. See, this blew my mind when I was doing research on Key West. There's two newspaper articles. One um, is in November of 1864, the other's in December, where two guys actually got out of Andersonville and instead of going north, they went south. So they hid in the Georgia swamps, they got to the blockading vessels and they eventually got to Key West. One of them went from Key West to New York on steamer and one just stayed on the island. Wow. So, uh, and drank pina coladas for yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Buffett, wasn't there yet. <laughs> Anything's paradise compared to Andersonville. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so Angie was slated uh, to speak. Uh, this June at the uh, Silver Institute. And uh, as our viewers can see, uh, so unfortunate uh, because she clearly would have given a fantastic talk. We will get her back to CWI. And as part of the package, Angie, I think that you should do a cycling tour <laughs> of Gettysburg. John, what do you think? Uh, yeah. I, I know my attendees and they would love to go up Big and little round top. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'll get the moped. Yeah. Right. We, might, we might need a little field hospital out there as well yeah. uh, to take care of the falling. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And, and as we close, we need to note that on Thursday at seven o'clock, we have Drew Bledsoe. Mm. Uh, Drew and John and I will be talking about whether tactical history matters. Is traditional military history or tactical history, is it worth our time? If you go to the Civil War compiler, our blog, you will see the article there, which I'd encourage everybody to read before our conversation. And John, I think we'll get Angie's uh, recommendation here. We, we need some music, man, to open up our show. And, really? Uh, I'm just curious, let's get our last shot here. Buckeye, her nickname is Buckeye from Ohio. All her friends call her Buckeye. Buckeye, give it to us. What is some music? What should we, uh, what should we do? Open our show with, tell us. Oh, man. oh gosh, for every show or for like- No, just for, no, for every show. And, and then look, I'll help you out here. It can't be Civil War theme music. That's okay. all. We're not doing that. No. Something popular. Well, I was thinking for today, we got to get out of this place. I mean, that, oh. <laughs> see, that would be good. I'll put that, I'll put that on the YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I don't get sued. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a problem. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a problem. Not, right. Yeah, I was thinking some mega death. Well, you could do that. Oh, or, I mean, for Thursday, you could do war pigs. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, I like that. My my podcast has like that Sabbath esque opening and stuff. So, <laughs> See? Yeah, something like that. It's fine. <laughs> Angie, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, it was a real joy to get to talk. Thank to you. you both for having me. I really enjoyed being here. Awesome. All right. Hey, and be <laughs> kind, be kind to those poor people in your class. When you see them again, they've not been doing spin for God knows how long. <laughs> Take it easy on them. Take it easy I'll try. On them. No yeah. guarantees, though. Take care, y'all. Thank you. Thank you all for watching. Tune in on Thursday. Next live show will be coming up. Appreciate you. Take care. Thank you.